Greetings, my name is Stefan Haggard. I'm the director of the Korea Pacific Program at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UCSD. I'll be moderating this webinar this afternoon. I'm just going to give a minute for everyone to get into the webinar and then we'll get started in about one minute. Thanks for your patience. Well, greetings again. Uh, my name is Stefan Haggard. I, as I said, I direct the Korea Pacific Program at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UCSD. And I'm very pleased to moderate this webinar today uh, with the title, Russia Invades Ukraine, the Curiouser and Curiouser Case of China. And I'll try to explain why that uh, title is appropriate. Uh, let me just talk a little about the format and the topic. Uh, last week, we had a webinar here at GPS on the broader context of the conflict, which looked at it from a strategic and economic and political perspective. But in the last week, it's become clear that Chinese posture with respect to the, the events in Ukraine are potentially determinative of the outcome. And so we decided it would be a good idea to devote a whole session solely to the question of what Chinese objectives might be and what the future of China Russian relations might look like, and needless to say, what the implications of that are for US policy. So let me uh, just say a, a word about the, the format of this before I introduce my colleagues. Uh, we're going to try to make this somewhat more conversational style. I'm gonna introduce the panelists and talk a little bit about what we're going to uh, address. Uh, but if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll try to moderate the questions and take as many of them as we can, or at least bundle them together, because we find that the interaction with the audience is really of value, value to us. I'm going to start today with my colleague, Susan Shirk, who really needs very little introduction. She's uh, one of the leading policy analysts of China and has been for some time. Her book, uh, Fragile Superpower, made an important contribution to our understanding of Chinese foreign policy. She's played a role in trying to uh, advance the cause of cooperation in Northeast Asia through the North Northeast Asian Cooperation Dialogue. And she ser served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, dealing with China uh, from uh, 1997 to 2000. So we're happy to have her on. And Susan, I'll be asking you about the larger strategic context in a moment. We're then going to back up and talk about some of the economic issues in a bit more granular detail. Uh, Victor Xu is well-known China scholar and has written extensively on issues of elite politics and factionalism, but he also has the distinction of having worked in the financial markets and is a close follower, both of Chinese financial markets and China's interaction with the global financial system. So we'll talk a little bit about sanctions. Wei Xi is an assistant professor here who is writing a, a book on the BRI and outward foreign direct investment policy. And one of the things we want to talk about with Wei Yi is the nature of trade between Russia and China and also where the BRI fits in or whether it does fit in to this new alignment. And finally, we're going to come back to Taiming Chung, who is the director of our Institute on Global Co Conflict and Cooperation. And he's written widely on technological competition between the United States and China and the Chinese military. And he has a new book on what he calls the Chinese techno security state, which is a great title timing. I wish I had come up with that myself. We hope you, uh, you brand it and make it, uh, make it famous. Again, if you have uh, questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A and I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. Uh, Susan, let me start with you. And I'm gonna pose my question in two ways, one a little more complicated than the other. But if you go all the way back to the Sino-Indian Agreement of 1954 and China's participation in the Bandung Conference, this idea of five uh, principles of peaceful coexistence has been a often restated formulation of Chinese foreign policy. And the invasion of Ukraine by Russia violates unambiguously all five of those principles which include non-intervention, non-aggression, uh, peaceful coexistence, and so forth. So the simple formulation of the question is, what are, what are the Chinese doing? 
Well, thanks very much, Steph. And it's great to be here with my colleagues from 21st Century China Center talking about this really critical moment in time. Um, Xi Jinping on the eve of the Olympics um, was really worried because of COVID and because he there was a diplomatic boycott that had been announced by the United States and by uh, most other major countries. The, uh, the only leader of a major country who is willing to come was Vladimir Putin, um, who has become a, a close a friend, I think it's fair to say, of Xi Jinping's. They've met 38 times and they have a kind of affinity because they're both ruling in a somewhat similar way as strongman personalistic leaders. And um, so Xi Jinping is very angry at the United States. He's frustrated because the Biden administration hasn't contradicted any of the Trump administration uh, tough action, especially the tariffs on China. And uh, here comes Vladimir Putin willing to sign a 5,000 word joint statement in which they pledge a friendship without limit. And this is just weeks before Putin invades Ukraine. So uh, the question, of course, that we'll never know the answer to is, did Putin hoodwink Xi Jinping by lying to him, by not telling him what his plans were? Or was Xi Jinping complicit, knowing that Putin was going into Ukraine, about to invade Ukraine? Uh, I think it's very interesting that Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, uh, has went on television and said that he, that the United States believes that Xi Jinping was aware that uh, Putin was planning something uh, and did ask him to delay it until after the Olympics, but uh, probably did not know or may not have known what, that there was a plan for an invasion. Um, and by stating that publicly, you know, Sullivan really gives a kind of opening for Xi Jinping to show some flexibility in where he stands now. Um, where, so far since the invasion, China has equivocated but tilted very definitely in the Russian direction. Uh, in their propaganda. And the Financial Times just reported that the uh, Biden administration has told European allies that when Russia made a request for military equipment or weapon support to China, China showed a favorable response. They didn't have details. But it's interesting that they went public with that. So they have definitely gone pro-Russian, but tried to sound neutral. Uh, and you know, this is really a major fork in the road for Xi Jinping and for China's future. It's somewhat similar to where Deng Xiaoping was when the Soviet Union fell. When the so Soviet Union fell, he had to make a decision about how China would react. And he took the most restrained approach in order not to provoke a confrontation with the West. And that's the choice that Xi Jinping faces now. Um, just a, a couple of words on the China-Russia relationship to provide a little context. Uh, there's no love lost between the these two neighbors. Um, they, uh, you know, they have fought. People have died in, in military confrontations between the two of them. Uh, the Sino-Soviet split broke out in 1959. Um, and more recently, the, uh, China has 
I'd say for the past 20, well, in the era of reform, showed real uh, caution about climbing out on a limb with Russia to poke a thumb in the eye of the uh, United States and other countries. Uh, Russia, of course, is its economy is about a tenth the size of China's. It's a relatively weak country, actually, compared to the, where China's going. And it's been not eager to, uh, China's not been eager to form a kind of alliance with Russia, although it did acquire a lot of Russian weapons. They have transactional um, cooperation, including military uh, joint exercises. But uh, there's a lot of mistrust between the two. Uh, but she really, I think, feels internationally isolated, very resentful of the United States, and, um, and has a kind of ideological and personal affinity for Putin. But if, uh, so long as he continues to uh, enforce the sanctions, even if he doesn't come out and publicly criticize the invasion, uh, just basically stays on the fence, I think that would be maybe the best the United States can hope for. And it would be very significant to have China not providing any tangible support and not um, making end runs to bail out Russia. Yeah, Susan, I, I want to just ask a very quick follow-up if I could, and it has to do with buyer's regret and whether you're seeing any trend in China's policy. I noticed that very shortly after the invasion, Wang Yi had already issued a five-point plan that suggested that China might play some mediating role, but of course that nothing has come of that to my to my knowledge. Uh, do you yeah. see any regret with respect to how expansive the joint statement was? Oh, absolutely. I think internally in China, this is probably being viewed as the biggest foreign policy blunder Xi Jinping has ever made. It was also a huge intelligence failure on the part of the Chinese government. They were getting, we were briefing them with our intelligence and my friends in government said, you know, Susan, they really don't believe us. They don't believe us. And their own intelligence wasn't good enough to tell them what was going on. So um, I, I think there's probably uh, more internal um, dismay than we are seeing. And we're not seeing it because uh, Xi Jinping rules like a strong man, and people are afraid of publicly criticizing him. And of course, that also may be a problem for Chinese policy now, because it's not possible for them to acknowledge that they made a mistake, because yeah. it was Xi Jinping's personal mistake. Yeah, let me let me come back to that at the end, Susan, when we talk about U.S. policy options. But Victor, I want to turn to you and talk about some of the sort of fine points, in a way, dive into the fine points of the sanctions, because despite the the attention that was focused on throwing them off swift and some of the uh, sanctions actions against particular oligarchs, I think it's pretty clear that the sanctions on central bank reserves that were held in Western central banks is probably one of the most consequential sanctions. Even with oil and gas carved out, those markets are clearly seeing a lot of turbulence because of concerns about clearance and payment and shipping and insurance. So can you just walk us through the ability of China to backstop Russia financially and even act as a lender of last resort if Russia really needs to be bailed out, which appears to be the case. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so basically, uh, China has a lot of uh, leeway to help Russia if it wanted to do so. Uh, first of all, you know, in terms of the basic essential, 
energy and food. Um, as Carolyn Ardeen pointed out last week, uh, Russia is more or less self-sufficient. Uh, because, you know, Russia's major breadbasket, Russia obviously a huge producer of oil and gas. Uh, so what it uh, imported from the West, uh, and we will get more into it, but, but um, I guess we can show one of the slides that I have, uh, we have prepared. I don't know if someone's going to put on that slide deck. Um, can we show the slides? Well, go, go, go ahead and oh, talk. Okay. Let's put out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here we go. Uh, so go back to, oh yeah, this, yeah, the next one, the next one after this one. Yeah, this one. So this is um, Chinese export to Russia. Uh, so even before, well, this is 2019 data, so a little bit dated. Uh, but I think roughly, you know, at least the composition didn't really change that much over time. Uh, so obviously, China is exporting technology uh, to Russia. But you know, for some things, you know, like vehicle parts, surprisingly, the dollar amount is not that big. You know, it's less than one billion dollars back in 2019. But you can imagine that with Western sanctions and a lot of companies in Europe and North America being unwilling to do business with Russian counterparts, um, basically the Russians can buy more of that kind of stuff from China, including telecom equipment, computers, uh, car parts, uh, maybe even uh, military hardware or parts for military hardware. Uh, and I'll let Ty talk to us about the compatibility uh, but let's go to the previous slide on that. So uh, China has an official reserve of uh, $3.2 trillion. It went up by $100 billion in the past two years because of a massive trade surplus during COVID. Um, on top of that, the shadow foreign exchange reserve also went up by $200 billion. This is what this slide shows. Uh, so shadow... Uh, foreign exchange reserve is dollar deposits in Chinese state-owned banks. Of course, there's a kind of a natural level, you know, roughly 800 billion or so, because you know China's a big economy. Chinese firms do a lot of business with the rest of the world. Um, but then suddenly you find that this deposit base goes up by 200 billion dollars, which is hard to explain because this is also a period when the renminbi strengthened by a lot vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. So uh, kind of a natural natural behavior would be Chinese firms wanting to convert the, the dollars into renminbi to take advantage of the stronger currency. But instead, you see a lot of Chinese firms leaving their money as dollars, uh, which you know kind of suggests the authorities sort of told them to do that as a way to um, you know store up the foreign exchange reserve without the reserve being actually uh, on safe balance sheets. Right. Um, interestingly, recently, there was something that happened very curiously during the NPC. It was announced that uh, the official foreign exchange reserve transferred 1 trillion renminbi, which is roughly $150 billion, to the Ministry of Finance. So the question is, well, Ministry of Finance, it spends renminbi mainly. What is it going to do with $150 billion U.S. dollars? Um, so one hypothetical use of it is to use it to finance a special purpose vehicle uh, to lend or to uh, buy energy from Russia, uh, allow Russia with some leeways to buy manufactured goods from China. Uh, again, I think the big question is, you know, the extent to which military or defense related equipment is going to be uh, manufacture and ship to Russia on the basis of some kind of Chinese money. Um, right. So, and, and Victor, if I can just interrupt, can, can you take us though back to the question of financing and, and whether you think China is in a position not just to finance its trade, but in some way provide liquidity to Russian financial markets, given, given the difficulty that they're in, I, I just know one point, you know, that, that's gotten some commentary is the collapse of the ruble means not only that what, you know, um, what uh, Russia exports is potentially more competitive, but also that Russian assets are incredibly devalued and could, you know, be a source of Chinese investment. Is, is anything like that? Is there any evidence of that kind of 
fire sale behavior going on? Uh, not that I noticed yet, but but I think that kind of stuff has been going on for quite a while. Uh, so China uh, had been investing. I mean, Thai knows more about this, but I have I have heard stories about you know China investing in defense companies in Russia, in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. So there could be a little bit more of that. I mean, the great thing about what Russia exports, oil and gas, is that um, the unit of accounting for it is highly continuous. Uh, and also it can be pegged to a price that's globally acknowledged, right? So oil and gas prices, there's a global price for it. Right. So even if the Russians would say, okay, we'll sell it to you, China, at 40% discount from the world price, China can immediately calculate what that means, um, you know, how much benefit is getting from Russia, and then can use Chinese registered entities to buy things uh, in the world that Russia needs, and then kind of transship it to Russia. So that, that's kind of what China did for North Korea uh, in the past. Uh, some Chinese companies got in trouble for it certainly something that China can do again. Except I think, I guess one thing I would say is that helping a pariah state during normal circumstances is very different from helping pariah state during a war. During a war, Russia will need, you know, millions of tons of equipment and materials shipped to the country every month. And that is not something you can easily hide uh, from the rest of the world. You know, Actually not in our world with you know, thousands of satellites watching everything that goes on, both by governments and by the private sector. Yeah, no, I, I think there's a very important point. And, it, and it's in addition to the fact that the U.S. is, I'm sure people in Treasury are looking very closely at whether any of this trade violates sanctions in such a way that the United States would consider secondary sanctions on Chinese entities that are trading with the Russians, which I think is going to be a decision which is looming soon. Uh, Wei Yi, can we turn to you about the trade picture? And, and maybe we can get these slides back up um, because you have a couple of slides you put together on. Yeah, I can just share my own slides. Okay. Uh, that's all right. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so, um, so earlier, um, Susan was saying that, um, you know, we, we, we should be, uh, celebrating in some ways already um, if China uh, would just stay on the fence um, in this conflict. And I think there is, um, there, there are good reasons to believe that that could be actually very realistic to accomplish at least for the time being. And uh, the reason why I say that is uh, if we actually look at uh, China's trade position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West and Russia, and what China is currently doing is actually exactly where its economic interest is putting it to be. And that's what it should be doing. So, um, so we all probably have seen a lot of discussion in the media in over the last couple of months and weeks that China has really gotten much closer to Russia in terms of trade and trade volume between China and Russia have uh, really um, been risen very quickly, on, especially in the last few months. But if you actually look at the data in terms of China-Russia trade in the context of China's trade with the US and EU, uh, it's actually consistent, consistent with, with the overall pattern. And, and the other thing, uh, if you're looking at the screen right now that you can take away from these graphs is that even though China's trade with Russia has been increasing, it's still minuscule compared to uh, China's interdependence with the West. And China, the US and EU are still the by far the largest trading partners in the world with one another. Um, and so in many ways, you know, this begs the question that that if China knows this, you know why why is it not siding um, more decisively with the West? Because clearly, uh, China's prosperity depends very much on maintaining a good relation, trading relationship uh, with the West. Now, here uh, is I'm hoping that we can walk through uh, exactly what's what could be going through China's calculus. In some ways, with the Western sanctions, uh, it's actually also helping to put China in where exactly it might want to be. Uh, 
uh, in this whole China, uh, Russia, and US EU uh, economic tripod, if we can sort of ignore the rest of the world for a moment. And um, so as uh, Victor was uh, referring to earlier, sort of the trade patterns, and Caroline also referred to last week, the trade patterns um, between Russian EU, so Russian in its position in the world is primarily a provision provider of raw materials and energy. Um, and the sanctions are uh, that's being imposed by the UNCU uh, is uh, getting to that, but also leaving actually quite a bit of loophole uh, as the dependence, of, especially of the European Union on Russian energy is uh, is is very high. Germany, for example, uh, imports up to forty five percent of its energy from Russia. Um, and in, in many ways in China's and Russian's economies are actually complementary. So to the extent that the US and EU are cutting off some of the energy over the longer term, uh, sort of in the, the, um, the decrease in the dependence on Russian energy, um, and especially if um, the Russian currency also becomes and continue to become devalued over time, and then Russia can actually pick up a lot of the energy uh, export, and that that is in China's interest to do so. And as Victor also uh, mentioned earlier, then Russia over time will also become increasingly dependent on Chinese technology. And uh, by association, and perhaps Tai will comment on this later, uh, that then, then in, in exchange, China will have better access to Russian military technology as well. And so we can expect to see that increase um, over time. And Xiaomi, for example, is already uh, the second largest uh, cell phone seller uh, in Russia anyway. And, 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 then, and then between you, the West and China, um, so I mean, we could potentially expect to see um, more stringent technological restriction um, to China. But in, in some ways, um, uh, if you put yourself in the shoes of Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping likely seeing the events over the last few years, probably did not have any false hope about whether China was going to get out of the doghouse in terms of technology vis-a-vis -vis the West anyway. So I think, you know, in many ways they anticipate this will happen anyway with or, with or without Russia. Uh, and with the uh, sanctions from the West, we could actually potentially actually see trading between China and the West uh, in sort of um, majority of the goods and services actually continue to rise, especially uh, if the energy um, import going into China uh, serve to lower the cost of production uh, in China. So, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, can, do I have a couple more minutes, Steph? Yeah, go you? ahead. Uh, okay. but, yeah, maybe you can wrap up. All right, yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna wrap up quickly. But obviously, um, so in some ways, yeah, so, so, so the sanctions are, are, China could actually benefit uh, from the sanctions being imposed without violating the sanctions themselves. Um, and then of course, you know, the question still is um, then um, how does the, the rest of the, uh, the world come into play? But it, because I mean, logically, I mean, even, even if Russia then gets swept uh, into China's influence more, Russia still, you know, it's, it's not a very important economy in the world. Um, but then you look at, you know, sort of the most ambitious um, initiative under Xi Jinping, the child's, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, the six corridors. And two of them directly involve Russia. And a lot of them are directly within the Russian sphere of influence. And with all these countries involved in the BRI, very few of them, if any, can be considered actually countries within uncontested contested sphere of Chinese influence. So for example, if we look at sort of uh, recent public opinion polls in the stands, um, and, and, and perhaps this is shifting now uh, with what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, um, but if we look at you know, these countries, the overwhelming support is for Russia. They consider Russia to be their friend, not China, even in terms of economic collaborations. 
And for China to be choosing to side with the U.S. is not also also not realistic because look at where the U.S. stands uh, in these countries. And China going out on its own right now doesn't make sense, a lot of sense either, um, because given China's policy in Xinjiang, uh, a lot of these countries feel very weary about China's growing economic influence in these regions too. So I think to me, this really, yeah, uh, <laughs> highlights sort of you know the limits of China's transactionalist approach uh, to its diplomacy. Yeah, there's a lot to chew on there, and I'd really like to come back to this BRI issue because obviously, to the extent that one of the objective was to create a land corridor all the way to Europe, it would seem like that objective is kind of in tatters. Um, timing, um, can we bring you in to close out uh, and talk about the prospects or maybe even something on the history of Chinese Russian military cooperation and, and whether they would take that step or deepen it and what the cost might be? Okay, um, I'll be happy to talk about that. I mean, it sounds like, um, I mean, to me, who follows the security military side, there's these two alternative universes, right? So there's the trade and the economic side that Wei Yi and Victor's talk, talked about. And they've mentioned like, I mean, maybe there's a like spillover and overlap between the economic and the military security. But I don't think that there is. I think within the military sphere, it's sort of very, very separate and, and, com and, com and com compartmentalized. That it's, um, um, and, and, and I also want to point out this, like, I mean, on the military security sphere, th that to me is the center of gravity of the overall China Russia relationship. Um, and that's, and, and, that, and there's a number of reasons for, for that. First of all, um, the military security relationship was the one that, that has thrived for the long, longest. I mean, it's like um, when, when we go back to look at the, um, the recent origins of the revival of the China Russia military relationship, so this took, took place at the end of the 1980s. And there's, there's a fascinating antidote, which sort of like, um, which is sort of like a reverse of where China and, and Russia is now. Um, back in the fall of 1989, um, China had found itself to be an in, international pariah because of the crackdown in Tiananmen Square. They had all these sanctions that sort of like, um, that faced from the West. And in the fall of 1989, the Chinese looked around and said, um, who are our friends? And it's like, and 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 the Chinese military who had a very close relationship with the West, but that but that was cut. They reached out to Moscow, sort of like around September, October, and they said, "Do you want to sort of like re-engage with, with, with with us?" And Moscow, and this is the Soviet Union at that time, said, "We'll be happy to." Itself, and I don't, and if and if you're a Chinese military off, off sort of um, sort of commander, you would sort of think it's like well, in our darkest of times, sort of the the Soviets at that time sort of like um, so what was happy to re reach out, and I suspect that that is going to be reciprocated, and the Russians are are, are going to be hoping for that, and that sort of like um, rapprochement formed the basis of a very very close um, Russian Chinese military relationship then that grew but the nature of this relationship um from then to to today was sort of a, um there, there was two elements one was in terms of the arms trade of sort of, sort of arms trans, trans, trans transfers and that's been pretty much a one-way flow that it's been russia that has supplied china with military equipment to the order around between 20 to 30 billion us dollars the russians have had very little interest on Chinese military equipment, which is why it's like, it's curious now that um, the Russians are reaching out and saying, well, well we want Chinese military assistance because the, the Russians, have, they, they don't really have much interest from an operational point of view. I think if they're reach, reaching out, it's from a strategic, a symbolic point of view, because I can't really see the, the Russians buying large, large amounts of military equipment. And that goes to the second point. I mean, the I think what is most important is in terms of that symbolism, that, that, that strategic, is that um, the key driver going forwards for the China-Russia military uh, uh, relationship, I think it's less to do with the arms trade, although that's going to be very, very important. It's to do with sort of like um, dealing with the U.S. as their strategic threat. And the, and the strategic threat dealing with the U.S. is like, um, I mean, it, it's important that like um, last November, 
China and Russia sort of signed an agreement that they would engage in lots of like uh, in strategic deterrence against the U.S. in terms of um, joint patrols that that we've seen sort of the Russian and the Chinese navies sort of like um, in the Sea of Japan, a sort of joint sort of early airborne earning p- p- patrols around the Korean peninsula. So that has been sort of the the raison d'etre for the long term China Russia. Um, strategic relationship. And that's important because it also relates to Taiwan, because it's it's a two-level game, right? So if the if the Chinese and the Russians can deter the US and its allies from intervening against Taiwan, then the Chinese can sort of have room then to deal with Taiwan by itself. Although I think what we've seen, the, the very poor performance of the Russians uh, sort of in the U- Ukraine has really pushed back the Taiwan window by at least sort of like a few years, if not longer itself. But it's like um, what, what so in terms of the center of gravity of the China-Russia um, um, sort of military relationship, yes, there's the arm trade and, there's, and, that, and that will be important, but it's what the Russians and the Chinese do strategically from a deterrence perspective in dealing with the West and the US that we should really be paying attention to. Thanks, Taiming. That that that's great. A lot to chew on. I want to get to the questions in the queue, but Susan, I want to come back to you first, and and ask where all this leaves U.S. policy at this juncture, and also advertise a bit, if I could, for the task force statement that you issued, which I thought was, you know, just very nicely crafted and almost pose this as a choice for China, which way are you going to go? And what should US diplomacy be doing? You're muted, Chen. Uh, thanks very much. Yes, um, 21st Century China Center and the Center on US-China Relations at the Asia Society has a task force that Orville and I co-chair uh, that's been issuing uh, papers and recommendations since 2015. And uh, for the first time, we issued a kind of emergency type of uh, quick and dirty uh, little paper uh, about what we call hard-headed diplomacy with China on Ukraine. Because uh, if you read the media now, what they're reporting is, and this certainly accords with my own impression, there are different points of view within the administration, the Biden administration, about uh, what we should be doing with China at this in this crisis. Some people basically believe that any uh, diplomacy and cooperation with China is a lost cause, uh, that we are hostile adversaries and uh, we should be just waiting for China to get closer to Russia in order to harden our policy against both of them. And there are uh, many others and it looks from what the Biden administration has done and that right now, they are more in the lead, who believe that it's important to try to engage diplomatically with China at this point in time, because what's at stake is just so huge. Um, It's what's at stake, of course, is the death of a lot of civilians in Ukraine. Um, The risks of, you know, this is already a massive catastrophe of refugees and civilian casualties, and it's probably going to get worse. The stakes are also high because if we already treat China and Russia as an axis of autocracy, um, then we um, are headed for a real new Cold War uh, against in two theaters where the Europeans will be working, the, um, the Russians will be uh, threatening the Europeans, the Chinese will be threatening other Asian countries, and it will be a very dangerous situation for the United States, not to mention the whole nuclear element that Ty brought up, uh, because one lesson that I'm sure China is taking from this crisis 
it, watching how when Putin starts talking about nuclear weapons, we are so fastidious that we must not get NATO, we and NATO do not want to be at war with Russia because that war could escalate to nuclear very quickly. So even to just talking about nuclear weapons, Putin has deterred us from doing more to support the Ukrainians. So of course, from the Chinese point of view, this uh, teaches them a lesson that they should build up their nuclear capabilities so they will be able to do the same with us uh, in regard to Taiwan. But our um, task force recommendation is that we should be pursuing diplomacy with China at this point in time, uh, if only to reinforce its uh, prudence about not uh, providing a workaround on the sanctions. Uh, and that it's probably good to concentrate on that element rather than having expectations about them coming out publicly to condemn the invasion, even to call it an invasion. Uh, I think expectations should be very low in that respect. And then the, it finally, it raises the question of whether or not um, we can encourage China to hold firm on the sanctions uh, in that sense to cooperate with us and the West by showing a little bit of goodwill, positive recognition of what they're doing so that they have some sense that it's not just the sticks of the secondary sanctions we will impose upon them if they do uh, help the Russians, but also that this could be the beginning of a more stable and productive relations with the United States. So then the question is, how do we show that kind of goodwill? Now, I'm not in favor of doing that this in a very uh, quid pro quo sort of way, like, well, what are we going to offer China? But it does occur to me that the tariffs, which are costly to American consumers and manufacturers, and yet we, the Biden administration has really been caught in a bind. It's it, any time, if they were to lift the sanctions, there are so many, especially Republican critics in Congress who would leap over them and accuse them of going soft on China. Well, if our highest priority is to save lives in the Ukraine, maybe with the stroke of the pen, we just lift those tariffs right. that are really helping nobody. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's that's really interesting advice. And for those of you who don't follow this closely, the tariffs that uh, Susan is referring to were the tariffs that were put in place that led up to the phase one trade deal, but were never lifted once that deal was put in place. I also just want to clarify, this is just my own no. early warning speculation. This is not in our task force report. Well, look, uh, I, I can't thank my colleagues enough for, for their interventions, but I do want to sort of shift gears and try to take some of the questions in the in the Q&A. And first, I just want to acknowledge that Richard Garwin has posted an extremely interesting link to a Chinese publication that suggests uh, that at least some in China are thinking along the lines that Susan has outlined. And I'll let that, that post speak for itself. Um, but let me uh, turn to the Asian landscape, because I don't think this is getting enough attention in the press. Everyone's focused on the European and US dimension, this Atlantic dimension of it. But we have a number of questions about what this means for Asia. And Ty, I might direct this first question to you. You made some reference to Taiwan, but what about Japan? I mean, recently, just over the last couple of days, there's been a lot of discussion about whether this would accelerate Japanese uh, change in military posture, acquiring strike, maybe even allowing the US to, 
stationed tactical nuclear weapons in Japan, which was quickly rejected by the administration, I should add. But the fact that it's being raised struck me as interesting in and of itself. Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's like um, what sort of, um, former Prime Minister Abe sort of mentioned, like perhaps Japan sh uh, should sort of need nuclear weapons now, which I think it's like, uh, is very, very unlikely. I mean, it's like um, Japan sort of, like, I mean, I mean, when we go back um, to the joint statement between P P P Putin and Xi, there was sort of like um, a very focused um, effort by the Chinese and the and the Russians to say, "Well, we are seeing the natification of the Asia Pacific. We're seeing it with the Quad, with with the Auckland, and sort of like there was this sort of like agreement by the Chinese and and the Russians that they've pushing back." against this. And so what we are seeing is that it's um, sort of the Chinese are really worried that sort of like um, we're, we're seeing sort of the, the formation of these mini NATOs and Japan is very much sort of like um, um, sort of like in the front line, especially with the Quad. And I think that um, as sort of like um, NATO revives its usefulness, its, its importance as a security alliance, Japan will look to sort of like use that to sort of further its its impetus. I mean, Japan doesn't have any security worries with Russia, but I think if Japan sees that China and Russia are sort of like significantly sort of like um, upgrades their military cooperation, etc., this has profound impacts for Japan, and and Japan's really I think it's like is seeking to get it to get ahead of of the issue and it's like and for japan it's like i mean the taiwan issue is also very much sort of front line so i think if you're a japanese um, sort of security plant 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 plan, i mean you sh there's a lot of reasons to be concerned and to, to look at intensifying sort of um, security cooperation with the us and also to find ways to sort of like come um, to develop closer mil military um, co cooperation with other regional states. Thanks. Thanks for that, Atai. Uh, I, uh, Victor, I'm going to pose the next question to you. It actually is a, often a somewhat of a tangent, but it comes from Poonam Narawat. And she asked a very interesting question about the role of democracy and autocracy in the current conflict. If you haven't read the joint statement, its first section is devoted to a redefinition of the concept of democracy. And if you want to read something else equally extraordinary, at the time of the Conference of Democracies that Biden hosted, China issued this incredibly long and detailed defense of its political system. Poonam asks, is this a useful framing of this conflict or does this make things worse by drawing these strong binaries between democracies and autocracies? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think certainly uh, it matters uh, for the public um, in the democratic world uh, in terms of why it feels so strongly about Ukraine. Uh, so a lot of the behavior that Russia and, you know, even some people in China accuse Ukraine of doing is, you know, an allowing or sort of tempting NATO to to become more involved with Ukraine, therefore threatening Russia's uh, Russian security. Uh, but I think in the Ukraine, this was done from popular pressure, right? So the people of Ukraine would like that, would like greater engagement with NATO. Uh, and I think so that gives those actions more legitimacy, right? So this is not like a small cabal of you know, whatever, neo-Nazis or something in Ukraine trying to um, enact certain policies. Uh, this was popular will, especially in the aftermath of what happened uh, in 2014 with, uh, you know, the separatist region and, and so on and so forth. So I think in that sense, it, it does um, make a difference. I mean, it, it does, uh, at least for much of the public uh, in among established democracies in the in the world, um, they, for this reason, will be a lot more supportive of Ukraine than Russia. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's obviously the case. Uh, I want to come to you, Wei Yu, with a question again that's a little off kilter. 
But, you know, there's a lot of work in political science about how public opinion in China may actually constrain the leadership, even if that public opinion is driven by the leadership. And uh, there's a question here about how China is portraying this or allowed the conflict to be portrayed domestically. Do you have any take on, on what that could mean? Uh, does this tie Xi Jinping's hands in any way that, uh, that he's unleashed this pro-Russian narrative? And Susan, you may want to jump in on this too. Wei Yi? Uh, yeah. So um, I think my internet just acted up a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so I think it's actually been super um, interesting to sort of look at how, how the censor machine in China has been uh, tweaking uh, the way how they're shaping the narrative uh, very quickly uh, just over the last couple of weeks. It's shifted several times. I think in the very beginning, uh, the, the machine was allowing quite a bit of uh, sort of pro uh, Russia rhetoric um, to be going on and even on um, someone encouraging that. Uh, and then, but, but then I think slowly uh, we were seeing that, you know, uh, that, 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 that allowance has um, has uh, shrunk, and then and I think now sort of what we are seeing is that uh, that the sensor machine is trying to uh, just shift heat away from this whole topic in general, uh, and wanting to make sure there's not too much discussion either pro Russia or anti Russia uh, that's happening. And then, and I believe that the statement that uh, Richard posted in the uh, chat is actually currently being censored uh, in China. Uh, the, the statement from Huawei um, reflecting, and I'm sure this is no small uh, minority of voice in China, but, but we just cannot hear it um, in media that, you know, that is asking for China to take a stronger stand uh, against Russia, but it's not. Um, being allowed right now, um, yeah, and I think you know, in 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 this, um, in some sense, I think this is consistent uh, with what we might expect uh, the the Chinese government to do, um, given how for the moment it's still trying to stay on the fence. But at the same time, I think I would say that um, the way the conflicts have played out. So far, the you know with uh, the technology we have now and the fact that everything is being played out in real time uh, has really, I think, um, increased the importance of just the public opinion of everyday people uh, and and enhanced the importance of that, enhanced the pressure on that um, uh, in um, on all leaders around the world. And I think, in many ways, this kind of will highlight. And just the limit of China's very transactionless approach to foreign policy to try to kind of rely on that and, and that alone as a way to push its foreign policy agenda is that I think what's happening is that when so much of public is involved um, uh, in, in the indirectly, in the indirect way in how we are perceiving this conflict and um, I think that it does it does put the conflict in a much more uh, value based lens, um, and I think China's approach really runs against that, um, and it's not doing its future standing in the world any favors. Look, we're we're drawing to the end. I really wish we had more time. Uh, it's such a pleasure to 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 listen to you talk and think about these issues out loud. But Susan and Ty, let me close with an issue. Uh, that is just getting a tremendous amount of attention, which is the Taiwan dimension of this. Uh, I have my own take. I think that these concerns with respect to China exploiting this opportunity are overblown. They've got their hands full. But is there anything that we should be concerned about with respect to Taiwan in the short to medium run? Uh, Tai and then Susan, maybe you can wrap up on this. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Steph, I mean, as I, I, I'm right with you. I mean, it's like, as I said, I mean, I think um, um, what's going on with, with Russia, U Ukraine has pushed the timeline if um, China wanted to do anything with Taiwan much further down by several years, if not more itself. 
Although, of course, it's like um, when you look at sort of the military sort of like campaign to the, the invasion sort of like um, in, in, in Russia, Ukraine, means like um, one, one of the lessons that the Chinese will learn is that it's like um, sort of, so doing an invasion is very, very, very complex itself. Um, so um, I don't think that um, it's um, it's likely. And um, and if you have a look, like when you look at sort of Xi Jinping's strategic calculus, he's much less willing to use direct military force than P -P Putin. Um, Xi Jinping has much preferred the use of indirect force, whether it's dealing with Hong Kong or 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 Xinjiang, he is much more sort of like um, risk adverse to the use of, of actual full-blown military force. And I think um, sort of um, the Ukraine would have taught him sort of that is even more of a worry to, to do that. Susan? Susan, do you have any final words? And then maybe Sherry, we can, uh, we can just outline for our viewers some of the 21st century events, uh, 21st century China events that are coming up. Susan? Well, on Taiwan, I think the um, brave resistance of the people of Ukraine is a kind of uh, object lesson for Beijing, uh, because it would have to consider after military action against Taiwan, any kind of occupation of Taiwan, you would have fierce resistance from their population. So it's got to, having seen that vividly in Ukraine, I think that will discourage them. Uh, and I, most of the, the real Taiwan and cross-strait experts that I'm not one of them, but most of them uh, have felt that our current uh, kind of panic about Taiwan is not uh, necessary, that Beijing is not planning any kind of attack on Taiwan, uh, certainly through the 20th Party Congress next fall. But even after that, uh, the military doesn't feel ready yet, and they'll basically move when the military feels ready. Uh, and then finally, I think, the speed with which the world has mobilized these sanctions and turned against Russia is another object lesson for China, which has a salutary effect because uh, they can anticipate the same thing would happen to them mm -hmm. if they were to attack Taiwan. No, I, I couldn't so, agree more. No. So that's the sort of silver lining of what is otherwise a pretty uh, depressing situation. Right, and I, I should add, not just the speed, which we've failed to do in the past, but the severity and yeah. the fact that so many of the particular sanctions, Nord Stream 2, the central bank sanctions were far beyond what people considered the outer limit. Remember when we were talking about kicking them off swift as, the nuclear option, and clearly things have gone much farther. Sherry, uh, do you want to just put up this last slide so I can let some of our viewers know there are a couple of things coming up later today, believe it or not, uh, there, I'm uh, hosting a, a webinar on the Korean elections, which are obviously quite of interest. Uh, we have a conservative candidate coming back into the Blue House. Eric Mobran from RAND will be talking about the election uh, today. Uh, Demeter Georgiev is a former PhD student here, is currently at Syracuse University, and has done a lot of excellent research on uh, politics, Chinese politics. He has a book called Retrofitting Leninism, which is on participation in China. And then finally, March 24th, we have uh, a presentation from Ling Cheng on the tech war and why state business relations matter in China and the United States. I hope very much that those of you who are on the call can join us for those events. In two weeks, we're planning a third in our Ukraine series, what's becoming a Ukraine series. We'll be pulling together some people with expertise on the energy markets and the commodity markets, which are also in tremendous turmoil as a result of the events in Ukraine and talking about what the implications of those uh, 
changes in commodity markets might be for the world economy. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you at future GPS and 21st Century China Center events.